Magic Church the Nazarene on this uh, 15th day of October. Time flies. And uh, we move closer and closer to uh, the holiday season. And uh, we're glad you're here today. If you joined us here at the, in the sanctuary or if you've joined us online, we're very happy that you have come along with us. And our hope is that you'll be encouraged by what is sung, what is uh, prayed, and what is taught this morning. In your bulletin, I want to highlight two things that are of great importance. Uh, in the next month, we will have a couple of very important uh, events, and we need your help. First of all, uh, at the end of the month, on October 30th, you'll see there at the bottom of your bulletin, you'll see there that the Trunk or Treat, an annual event that we have done for many years, and uh, we need helpers. And uh, we need seven cars that are willing to cooperate with us as we uh, make our way, as we prepare to do the seven days of creation. So if you could volunteer your car, that would be helpful. And then it takes people to uh, do this and carry off everything that is going to take place. Someone has said uh, the key in studying history is that you learn from history because if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And uh, you know what? I've been at churches where uh, they did things, but uh, they didn't get enough help. So guess who got to be the bad guy? <laughs> yeah, the pastor said, we don't have enough help. It's time to pull the plug on this. And uh, so we don't want to repeat history. Uh, we just ask that you would uh, consider how you could help us for the trunk or treat and uh, so we could make it effective outreach to our community. And then the Veterans Day service is scheduled for Sunday, November 12th, and you'll see the information there. That information helps, to, uh, helps you to participate, and if you have family or loved ones who have served or are currently serving, uh, please uh, feel free to turn in some photos Mark them appropriately, put them in an envelope with your name on it so they can be returned to you, and a special presentation will be put together uh, for the Veterans Day service. This time, I'll turn it over to Karen. to go with this, and Steve mixed it. He said, not appropriate. So <laughs> Now we've got to know what it is. Steve doesn't think it's appropriate? Wow. But we do love and appreciate both of you. Um, this little
For the Lord is the great God. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his life. Come, let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. It says, let us shout aloud. So that's exactly what we are going to do. Let's sing together. My Jesus. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roll. At the sound of your name, I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. In you. Amen. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. For He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy exalted the king is exalted on high 
He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted. I will praise His name. For He is the Lord, forever and true shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His heart.
depending on his lordship, what he's given for us, all we can do is sing out a love song. sing out a love song to your son Jesus Christ we thank you so much that when we come to him he fully understands what we are experiencing the joy of life the joy that comes in believing and following your plan your purposes but Jesus it tells us in the book of Hebrews, faced every temptation, faced every sorrow, faced everything that we face, and he faced it without sin. And Lord, we we're thankful for the fact that you have given us your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that uh, he laid down his life so that we might walk with you, our Heavenly Father in peace, and with purpose. And we also take tremendous hope in the fact that even though, as David said, we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear. We need not fear the evil one or evil. And Father, we just pause now to pray for the situations of our world. Of course, Israel is on the front front pages now, and we pray for the people of Israel, and we pray for the Palestinians who are also being destroyed and facing turmoil because of war. And Lord, it's so easy to forget that there's an evil being battled in Ukraine also. And so we, we not only pray for the most recent headlines, the people of Israel and what's taking place there in the Gaza Strip, but once again, we are reminded that uh, some of your precious creation, people, are suffering greatly in Ukraine. And Lord, we, we pray that as each one of us, as members of the human race, as we face the challenges of our daily lives, be it war outwardly or war inwardly, Lord, we pray that we would experience Jesus Christ the Prince of Peace. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would offer protection to those who are innocent. We pray that you would give wisdom to those who must make decisions. And Lord, we, in our humanity, our, re our reaction would be that this is a mess that nothing good can come out of. But Lord, we read in the scriptures that you are in control. We read in the book of Revelation that Jesus Christ is right there. He's the Lord himself. He's right next to you. And Lord, we read quite clearly that nothing takes you by surprise and that you are the one who is ultimately in control. That was the message 
to the first century church as they faced the persecution and the oppression of an anti-Christ Roman Empire. And Lord, it's your words to us as we face an anti-Christ regime and regime, regimes that try to destroy that which is good in our culture. And Lord, we, we look to you. We look to you for our hope. We look to you for our protection. We look to you for wisdom, wisdom that's beyond ourselves. And Lord, in our own lives, we, we pray for those who are part of our families who are being affected because of the evil that's in our world. Lord, in our own family, our, 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 our nephew just became a sailor. and Lord, just a young sailor, and though he's in training, the word comes that his group may be on alert. So Lord, we, we just pray. We pray. We seek you. May we not get caught in the division over right and wrong, but may we get caught up in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign, that God the Father has control, and the Holy Spirit wants to breathe his life into us as the church. Give us the grace we need, Father, to be the church, to be your representatives in a chaotic world that seems to be destroyed more and more every day. And Lord, we do pray for our church. We pray that uh, those who are wandering aimlessly would find a purpose, that they would find the purpose. Lord, our prayer is that uh, we would take time to just turn our eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. And Lord, we as we studied your word this week and as we contemplated what your word teaches us, we began to once again be reminded that if we're truly people of the book, we become more like Jesus Christ. And we live a life that's different from what is portrayed through social media and through the conversations and the bickerings and the anger that is expressed in our world. Lord, we pray. We pray for our, our community. We pray for our county. We pray for those of us who call ourselves Christians. Lord, may this time of trials, may this time of fears, may this time of destruction May it be a time when the people of God are revived and renewed. And we pray that just as the people of the first century held on to Jesus, Lord, our prayer is that we too would hold on to Jesus, that we would not revert to that which we are familiar with, that we would not resort and pray that you bring us back to what we're comfortable with. But Lord, may you teach us though we may be living as aliens and exiles in this world, give us the grace to stand firm, to hold on to you. And Lord, for our church, we pray that we would be a beacon of hope. We pray that you would enable us to shine brightly, br brightly reflecting Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Father, as we come now to the time of looking at the Word, as we reflect on what we've already sung, and as we reflect on and prepare ourselves for what you are going to say, may we just lift up a love song once again.
sang it that second time, I couldn't help but contemplate in moments like these. How appropriate that in a time where our world is in chaos and as the chaotic influences of our world grow deeper and deeper and seemingly stronger and stronger, in moments we can sing out a love song to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of the faith. A preschool teacher asked her class one day, if you could be any animal in the world, what would you choose? Little girl answered, I would like to be a soft purring kitten. One young lady said, I want to be a mink, a built-in warm coat. Now, the boys, of course, their answers were a little different. I'd like to be a lion. Another said, I'd rather be a tiger. One youngster said, I'd like to be an elephant. Well, think what it'd be like to squirt water through your nose. That would be fantastic. That would be so cool. What's interesting, the teacher said that uh, through the years, she's asked that question to her children, and she's never heard a child say, I'd like to be a sheep. When we think of symbols of the world, nations of the world, they oftentimes choose an animal that symbolizes their nation. U.S., a soaring eagle, a majestic eagle. I've never seen a picture of a wimpy eagle (laughs) representing the United States of America. Canada, it's the industrious beaver. Great Britain, they choose the lion. Russia, the bear. But I did the research. No nation has ever adopted the sheep or a sheep as the symbol of their nation. Why would a child never think to want to be a sheep? Why would a nation never choose a sheep to be the symbol of their nation? Well, when you think about it, a sheep represents everything we don't want to be. Defenseless. Dependent. Helpless. In my notes, I have the word stupid. Now, I learned the hard way that that's not a very good word in today's culture. I was preaching in southern Texas, and uh, there was a grandma and grandpa who had their little girl, and they were seated toward the back, and uh, the little girl was coloring, and I didn't think she was paying any attention to me. And I was describing the weather there in south Texas in the wintertime, how pleasant it was, and how stupid cold it was up in the north. And that little girl who was coloring stopped and her head shot up. She said, Grandma, that preacher said stupid. So I learned that you don't say that word anymore. So rather than being defenseless, dependent, and helpless, sheep are foolish. But David, David writes in Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. Or saying it another way, I'm a sheep. I'm a defenseless, dependent, helpless, foolish being. And he goes on to say, because I'm a sheep and because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want or the NIV translation translated, I shall lack nothing. Would you think about that? Since the Lord is my shepherd, since I'm truly a defenseless, dependent, helpless, foolish sheep, I have everything I need. I will never lack anything. I will not be in want. And see, what David is saying is something about himself. He points out 
the goodness of the shepherd, but to really grasp and understand what he is communicating, you realize that he is making a confession and he is talking about, he is describing himself. And to fully appreciate Psalm 23, you and I must understand that David writes from the perspective of not an eagle, not an industrious beaver. He doesn't write from a lion or a tiger or a bear. He writes from the perspective, I am a sheep who follows the shepherd. And what I want for us to understand on this second week of looking at Psalm 23 is that you and I will never experience the benefits of the beautiful picture that's found in Psalm 23 unless we are a sheep. Our life reflects this attitude that I'm defenseless, I'm dependent, I'm helpless, and I'm foolish. David recognized that because of who he is, because of his total dependence upon the Lord, he could say with confidence that the Lord is my shepherd, so I will never lack anything I really need. That term translated uh, lack nothing or want, will want nothing contains the picture of deficient, deficiency. Because the Lord is my shepherd, because I am a sheep, because I'm totally dependent upon the shepherd, I will never be deficient for what I need to live life according to his purpose and according to his plan. You see, before we look at what the benefits are in verses 2 down through 5, we have to take the opening statement and realize that that unlocks all the blessings, all the benefits that are described in verses 2 through 5. And the first thing that we want to understand, he says, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. David is talking about, writing about a relationship with a person a relationship with the Lord himself. Do you know him? No, not, not, did, have you been to Sunday school or do you, or do you, well, you say your prayers, you, you say your prayer, do you really know him? Are you intimately involved with the Lord? Are you so close to him that you actually can feel his breath? You know, you look in John chapter 20, and it says that Jesus breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit. They were so tight. They were so close in that upper room that evening where Christ, when he breathes on them, they actually experience the reality of the Holy Spirit. It's a relationship, not with a term, but with a person. Not with someone out there somewhere, but with a person. The Lord is my shepherd. See, what we tend to do is to rush to the green pastures, the quiet waters, the table filled with food, and an overflowing cup. And the truth also is, we grow uneasy to any thought of a journey through the shadow of death. The truth is, it's very easy to ignore the shepherd. We can be so attracted to all the shepherd does, but the beginning and ending of Psalm 23 is a picture of who the shepherd is. He is verse 1, the Lord. He is verse 6, the Lord whose house, the Lord whose kingdom, the Lord, whose reign is forever. This week I took time 
to read through the 23rd Psalm and remove any reference to the shepherd. Notice how the 23rd Psalm reads when we remove the shepherd from Psalm 23. First of all, we read, My, I shall be in want. Me, me. My soul, me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear me, me, me. Me in the presence of my enemies. My head, my cup. Me all the days of my life. I will dwell. I don't know about you, but that touches me with, a, with sorrow deep within my being. That there are times when we become so much unaffected and disassociated with the shepherd himself that our lives reflect my and being in want and me and me. And even when it comes to my soul, it's all about me. And when I walk through the fire shell, did I fear me, me, in the presence of my enemies? It's my head, it's my cup. And all the days of my life, this is where I dwell. Paul Miller, after asking us to contemplate the 23rd Psalm by taking out the Lord, the shepherd says this, we are left obsessing over our wants in the valley of the shadow of death, paralyzed by fear in the presence of our enemies. No wonder so many are so cynical. Wow. Both the child and the cynic walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The cynic focuses on the darkness. However, the child focuses on the shepherd came across a thought last night. Spent several hours in bed, very little time sleeping, because I was contemplating the truth of Psalm 23 and my own life and what my life, how it reflects the truth of the Lord being my shepherd and not lacking anything and having everything that I need. I'm never deficient. And this thought came to my mind. Have you ever thought about the fact that a child has no problem believing that there is a God? In other words, we teach children through our words, through our actions and through our attitudes, we teach them that there is no God. Think about it. We are left obsessing over our wants. Child and cynic both walk through the valley of shadow of death, but the cynic focuses on the darkness because the cynic has bought into the belief well, there is no real, there is no Lord, there is no shepherd. But the child focuses on the reality, focuses on the reality that there is God, and the child focuses on the shepherd. See, what I want for us to understand is that all the experiences that are described in Psalm 23, verses 2 through 6, are ours if and when the Lord is our shepherd. And when the Lord is my shepherd, when every area and activity of my life is under God's direction, under God's protection, and under God's control, then I will experience the blessings that are described in verses 2 through 6. Let's move from thinking philosophically and theologically and Let's ask ourselves a very simple, practical question. 
if I really believe that there is a God and he is the shepherd of my life, if I am a follower of the shepherd, would I ever complain? Our culture has fine-tuned the habit of complaining. Our culture has even come up with good sound good sounding excuses for complaining. Hey, life's tough. We all need a safety valve that lets off the pent-up resentment and frustration. There's the problem. It's pent-up resentment and frustration. We got to get it out in the open. Yeah, you need to get it out in the open and be and honestly come to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him know what you are feeling, express to him what you're feeling, and listen to him and be open to him and let him bring healing to that resentment and that frustration. I just need to vent. Vent to him. And let him talk back. Let Listen. I had one of my students uh, email me a couple weeks ago. She was in a, three or four of my classes, and she said, Pastor Bob, at some point you said something about a suggestion of what to do with people who are in the midst of depression they can't get out of it. What was it you recommended? And I said, well, I think you're referring to that uh, if someone is dealing with depression, encourage them to take their Bibles and begin with Psalm 1 and read it out loud. Don't just read it casually, passively. Read it out loud. Take one psalm a day. Work your way through it. And within two or three days, you know what you're going to be saying? Lord, life sucks! That's my own translation. I'm angry. I'm ticked. Life's not fair. See, God can deal with it. God can handle it. And so, complaining. Should anyone who's a follower of the shepherd complain? Should our lives be filled with... The truth is, when we complain to others we are stating that, you know, I really don't have what I want. I really don't like my situation. What's happening? It's just not fair. You see, we can easily quote the first half of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, but trusting the shepherd and the shepherd's sufficiency in all of my needs? Mm. Dallas Willard says this, the Lord is my shepherd is written on many more tombstones than on lives. You see, David truly believed that the Lord was intimately involved in every detail of his life every single day. That kind of faith results in accepting God's will with joy. What stabilizes and controls us is the fact that the shepherd never leads us into a situation in order to hurt us or desert us. Many of those who are dealing with bitterness and resentment need to come to the realization that though it has come into their lives, the Lord did not bring them to that situation in order to hurt them or to desert them. He has come beside them in the midst of their tragedy. He's come beside them in the midst of their brokenness because he wants to bring you to be becoming a person of faith. 
a deep faith, not a Hallmark card faith, a Psalm 23 faith, a faith that's maturing, a faith that is deepening, a faith that knows beyond any shadow of a doubt that the shepherd always has our best interest at heart. I may be slighted. I may be treated unfairly. I may have to do an unpleasant tax, a task. Taxes usually are those. I may be slighted. I may be facing an unpleasant task. I may be greatly frustrated. Yet I'm still at peace. A biblical illustration, Numbers 13 and 14. I'd encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Numbers 13 and 14. I see some hands moving. I hear some clicking of devices. I hope you'll follow along. If you don't have it with you to right now or you don't can't follow along, I go too quickly. Just make a note, Numbers 13 and 14, and read through it this week. The context being, if we're truly the people of God, will we complain? Numbers 13 describes for us that it's time for the people of Israel to move forward, to move into the promised land. We read there in, verse, in chapter 13 that they send 12 spies into Canaan and they're going to explore the land. It's the first committee work. The committee's put together to do some research. So verse 21 of chapter 13 of Numbers says, So they went up and explored. Verse 23, they went to the valley of Eshkol, cut off a single cluster of grapes, and that single cluster of grapes was so large that they carried it, two men carried it on a pole between them. For 40 days, they explore, and they return to the, uh, to the village, they return to the people of Israel who are preparing to enter the promised land, and they give a full report Chapter 13, verse 27. We went into the land, and it's true. It does flow with milk and honey. Look at this cluster of grapes. But the people there are powerful. The cities are fortified, and they're very large. And the committee spread among the Israelites the bad report. Now, I want to turn to Numbers chapter 14, and I want to read together with you the first four verses of this chapter. Numbers 14, and then also some latter verses. So the committee does their work, and uh, The people become very intimidated. Chapter 14 of Numbers, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled. Grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt... They had prayed to God that they be taken out of Egypt. Oh, if we would have died back there. Or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives, our children be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Say what? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back. Egypt. See, when the Lord is our shepherd, in the midst of negative committee work, in the midst of reporting that focuses on the situation 
Instead of focusing on the Lord, who is our shepherd, who is leading us, we will typically not only not move forward, you know what we want to do, we'll want to go back to what we're familiar with. Even though we were miserable there, at least we knew what was going on. Come down. Look at verses 26 through 30. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints. I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. Boy, that's a picturesque term, isn't it? The complaints of the grumbling people. These grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In the wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counting the census, who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land. I swore with the uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. There were two of the ten, or excuse, two of the twelve, who said, I trust the Lord. Now, that's an Old Testament story, but it has New Testament truth for us. If you would, keep your Bibles open, turn to the New Testament, and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. See, this idea of complaining, this idea of grumbling, this idea of not truly resting in the Lord has New Testament truth. See, we are looking at the people of God, and we're looking at the context of Psalm 23, which is, the Lord is my shepherd. I am a follower of the Lord God. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And because I am a follower of Jesus Christ, my life is different. I live differently. And because I live differently, what comes out of my mouth is different. The example I set is different. Look at Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 3. And when we look at verses 7 through 11, we are going to realize that the Hebrew writer is quoting Psalm 95, which is another description of what we read in Numbers 13 and 14. See, this picture of the people not believing and grumbling and complaining shows up several times in Scripture. See, God really wants us to understand that as followers of him, we are different. So look, look at verse 7, Hebrews chapter 3. As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, if you hear the Lord, the shepherd's voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. He's talking about Numbers 13 and 14. What happened there? Well, that's where your ancestors tested and tried me. There are many people who day after day put the Lord to the test, expect Him to respond in a way that they think is best. And if God responds to their test and, they, and God passes their test, well, then I'll believe him. Jesus Christ in the wilderness was tested. By the, the enemy said, turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Surely your God Father, your Heavenly Father, would understand if you turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, the word also says that you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Your ancestor tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. 
verse 10. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. He's not talking about a day off. He's talking about a lifestyle. If you would, come down to verses 16 through 19. He continues. In fact, if you look there at verse 15, once again, he quotes from Psalm 95. And once again, he says, if you hear the voice of the Lord, if you hear the direction of the Lord, the good shepherd, don't harden your heart. Don't be rebellious. Verse 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness, and to whom God, whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter the rest of God because of their unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 1, he continues, Therefore, the promise of entering his rest still stands. It's resting in God. It's the Lord is my shepherd. I am never deficient. I never lack anything. I've got what I need. And I can continue to walk with him. Then chapter 4, verse 1, let us be careful not to have fallen short of it. Verse 19, complaining, grumbling, reflects unbelief. If we are truly a sheep of God's flock, we will join David in singing day after day, moment by moment, no matter what the circumstances, the Lord is my shepherd and I never lack anything that I really need. When the Lord is our shepherd, when we truly are a sheep of God's flock, we will continually sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Since John Bittar and Anne Shawa said, I do, back on November 25th, 1932, they have weathered many storms but they still greet each morning with eagerness and gratitude. John and Anne lived through the Great Depression, World War II, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, two powerful hurricanes. As of November 2012, John was 101 and Anne was 97. They still lived in their own home, they had five children, 14 grandchildren, and 16 great-grandchildren. When she was still a teenager, Anne's father had arranged for her to wed a local man in Bridgeport, Connecticut. But her heart already belonged to another, his name, John Batar. She and John eloped in Harrelson, New York, because as Anne said, we didn't have any money to go any further. People told them, It'll never last. That was nearly 80 years ago, and they are still happily married in 2012. They each offered some guidelines for building a lasting marriage, for building a lasting relationship with a person. In the 23rd Psalm, it's describing a relationship with a person, the Lord himself. John said, well, you get along, you compromise, 
you live within your means and you're content. And let your wife be the boss. <laughs> and countered, we don't have bosses. Both John and Anne are members of St. Nicholas Antiochian Orthodox Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And both acknowledged God as the source of their blessing. Anne said, How can you not feel God's right with you and blessing you? John reemphasized the importance of living with contentment. He said, We just live with contentment and don't live beyond our means. You know, there are hosts of people who've been involved with the church. Maybe they still are. Maybe you still are out there, still involved with the church. But never learned the secret of living a contented life. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Yep, I'm a defenseless, helpless, not too bright, needing protection sheep. I need someone to follow. I choose the Lord. He the person, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, he's the one that I follow. Father, the verse that comes in my mind right now is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Unfortunately, that's a bad translation. The truth does not, the truth of Scripture does not say that we can do everything. In fact, that's our problem. When we look at Philippians 4, verse 10, 11, 12, we discover that Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do this. That's a better translation. I can do this. What's this? I have learned to be content in every situation. If I'm well fed or if I'm hungry, if I have a lot or if I have nothing, I have learned to be content in all of life's situations. I can do that through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Lord, our prayer is that uh, having once again spent 25, 30 minutes in the 23rd Psalm, that our lives would be different. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be very real to us. And the moment a word of complaint starts to slip out, may we give the Holy Spirit permission to, to give us a nudge on, the, nudge, on the, nudge on the shoulder, tap us gently, or Lord, you probably need to hit me with a two-by-four. Lord, would you just stop us? And help us to think about the fact that when we complain, when we grumble, when we want to go back instead of going forward with you, give us the grace to trust you. We want to enter a life of rest. We want to enter a life not being lazy, but this a lifestyle that reflects a contentment and a peace of walking with Jesus. And because pursuing that relationship is the top priority of my life, because knowing the Lord himself is the top priority of my life, I just live differently. Lord, please. 
teach, teach us. Teach us to be content. Teach us to let you lead. Make us willing. May we be willing to be defenseless. and May we be willing to be vulnerable. And Lord, we know that we may be slighted. We may be treated unfairly. But Lord, may our focus not be where we fit in this world. May our focus be how we fit into your family and how we're walking with you. Lord, give us the grace to experience the peace, to experience the rest. Lord, help my unbelief. Help my excuse-making. Lord, please, teach me to trust you. May, may you be our boss. May you be the one that we turn to for every moment of every day, be it for a blessing to say thank you or for a need to say, please direct me. Join with me, with me, would you? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And as we go from this place, as we go through our week's responsibilities, May we be a sweet, sweet sound in his ear. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Go, follow the leader. <laughs> <laughs>